Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. We've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Good morning. Welcome to Undisputed. I'm Jenny Taft with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. How are you guys doing today? And it's a great day up in the hills. Ah, Skip, it's a great day up in the hills. How's it, how's it down there? Is everything okay? <laughs> Way down here in the flats, my humble abode, you up there in your palatial estate. All I know, Shannon Sharp, is that we got a big quarterback controversy in Green Bay. We got an even bigger quarterback controversy in Philadelphia. So that means my Dallas... Ca- wait, wait a second. We, we got a controversy, too. Come on, Jerry, yeah, get exactly. that side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're talking about everybody else's controversy. You got one brewing. Yeah, well. Definitely does. Uh, we do have a few <laughs> quarterbacks to discuss today. But as Skip previewed, I think we should discuss Aaron Rodgers and everything that's happening with Green Bay because the Athletics' Bob McGinn covered the Packers for 38 years, and he had some interesting insights on why Green Bay could have drafted quarterback Jordan Love. McGinn writes that Matt LaFleur may have drafted another QB because he, quote, simply had enough of Aaron Rodgers' act. McGinn continued saying that the Packers wouldn't want Rodgers to, quote, become even more difficult to coach. Shannon, are you buying this about your guy? No, Skip, because had Mr. McGinn, I don't know him, Skip, I'm sure you've known him, um, traveling in that circle over the extended period of time, you've probably crossed, uh, probably crossed this guy at some point in time uh, in your, your, your storied career, but I don't know him. Um, if he's covered the package for 38 years, I'm sure my brother would probably know who he is. But, Skip, for me, for him to say he, they might have an if, I, I don't like that. If he wants to come out and definitively say one way or another, okay, I can live with that. Uh, but for me, Skip, for them to use a first-round quarterback, a first-round pick on a quarterback, and they move up to get him, sure, I'm sure it got Aaron Rodgers' attention. But what a waste would that be in order for you to try to gain a perceived power struggle over the quarterback that you just handed $120, $130 million that you're paying him $33, $34 million a year, and you gave him, what, Skip, $78, $79 million fully fully guaranteed. When I look at it, Skip, um, the Packers, they were 15th in rush yards, 16th in rush yard average. Hmm, drafting a running back in the second round. What if that has something to do about Aaron Jones? Because what we're starting to see, Skip, teams are really hesitant to hand out second contracts to running back. Now, we saw Zeke get one. We saw Christian McCaffrey get one. Uh, A couple of years ago, uh, Todd Gurley got one. But more times than not, what we're starting to see, they're being hesitant or they're paying them less than what the, uh, uh, the, what is it, the franchise tag number is over an extended period of time. Skip, look, what has happened with Aaron Rodgers is that he's been so great is that he's been able to take lesser tier talent and that he had some great receivers throughout the course of his career. You know, Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson. He had uh, Donald Driver at the later stages of his career. Uh, James Jones led the league in touchdowns one year. Jermichael Finley before that neck injury. But other than that, Skip, what have they replaced him with? I was reading an article yesterday, Skip, and I didn't know this, and I know a lot of people don't know this. Aaron Rodgers, in his career has only thrown one touchdown to a number one drafted, a a first-round pick skip, tight end or wide receiver. Let that sink in for just a second. Not but one, and that's Mercedes Lewis last year. Skip, that is crazy. So what they've done is that they put all this, like, okay, Aaron, you do it. We're paying you all this money, you do it. And what probably, what is ticking Aaron Rodgers off is that he's done it for so long and they still refuse to go get him some legitimate help to go along with Devontae Adam. Skip, I don't believe this was about a power struggle. Um, do I believe uh, they, this move ticked Aaron off? 1,000%. Because anytime you take a quarterback and you move up to select him, that raises the quarterback, that gets the quarterback's attention. But a, per, a perceived power struggle, and you're going to take a first-round pick, the guy that's not going to help you for an extended period of time, this makes no sense to me. <sighs> 
It makes complete sense to me. What have I tried to tell you, Shannon Sharp, for three long years here on Undisputed? I have been the lone wolf saying, time out. Aaron Rodgers is no longer Aaron Rodgers. He's in decline. Three straight years, the stats have fallen, fallen, fallen. QBR falling, completion percentage falling. QBR last year was 54, which was the worst of his career. And his completion percentage ranked 21st in the NFL. And you can say this was a outlandish statement, but I've made it many times here on Undisputed. Given the pedestal that you put him on and others on Undisputed have put him on, Aaron Rodgers has become the most overhyped and overrated quarterback in the history of pro football. Given where you place him and you never, ever give an inch that, wait a second, he's not what he used to be. Aaron Rodgers got to one Super Bowl and won only one Super Bowl almost 10 years ago. And I keep saying, show me the money. You know, show me something. He's six and seven in the postseason since that one Super Bowl run in which they were the worst wildcard team. They were the road wildcard team. And since then, six wins and five of them are flawed, tainted, asterisk kind of wins in the postseason because he got to beat Joe Webb. Then he got to beat Kirk Cousins when he was really struggling in Washington when Dak owned him, was 4-0 against him. And then there was the Dez caught it game. Then there was the Giants boat trip game when Odell led the receivers to South Beach to prepare for a game on the frozen tundra at Lambeau. And then there was the Mason crossbar game at my stadium at Jerry World, in which Mason Crosby made two cross-country intergalactic field goals of 56 and 51 yards to save and win the game. And, and I'm saying, well, show me something, Aaron. And you can't. And Shannon, I, 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 I tried to tell you so. And, and finally, the two men who now run the Green Bay Packers, Gutekunst and Lafleur. They're saying, we're not seeing it anymore. And listen, Bob McGinn, I don't know him, but I have crossed his path. Okay. And I know of him, Shannon. He is the ultimate okay. source on the Green Bay Packers. He is the guru, the ultimate authority on all things Packers, knowing where all the bodies are buried. And when he writes... I mean, when Bob McGinn writes this paragraph that he wrote, I'm going to read it in its entirety because it is potent. You should take okay. this to your bank. So here's what he wrote. Public niceties aside, meaning they're all saying the right things about each other. Those things aside, right. my sense, this is Bob McGinn, is Lafleur, fresh from a terrific 13-3 and three baptismal season, simply had enough of Rogers' act and wanted to change the narrative. With a first round talent on the roster, Jordan Love, the Packers would gain leverage with their imperial quarterback. That's a shot. And his passive aggressive style, which is very hard for management to deal with through social media and through his radio gig that he does. If the Packers do indeed want to become a running team next season, they surely wouldn't want Rodgers rocking the boat and becoming even more difficult to coach. So again, I told you on Monday, there are reports in Milwaukee, they want to go running back. The, the key choice was not as much Jordan Love as it was A.J. Dillon in the second round. Big banger. Yeah. The next Derrick Henry, you know, 250 pounds who ran 4-5 at the combine, high carries workhorse back, and I think they want to start letting him tote the rock and take the ball more and more out of Aaron Rodgers' hands before they put it in Jordan Love's hands sooner than later. And the final line that I would read is, 
It'll work for the GM and the coach only if Jordan Love can play. Well, Shannon, I told you going into the draft, I don't know about that. I didn't watch him enough. I have definitive opinions about a lot of quarterbacks, but I'm not sure about Jordan Love. And again, right. just for the record, Bob McGinn does huge pre-draft homework. Remember, we did C.D. Lamb versus Jerry Judy, and he did the big poll right. of, of 17 personnel people who gave 10 first-place votes to C.D. and only five to Jerry Judy. On Jordan Love, Bob McGinn's research told him the mixed reviews tended to be more no than yes on Jordan Love. Aha! Mm -hmm. so, so Bob McGinn is also admitting this is a longer shot than you might think on Jordan Love being able yeah. to replace Aaron Rodgers. But my final right. point, and then I'll let you respond to everything I just said, Bob McGinn also has pointed out in another piece that he wrote that in the grades, he always gives the Green Bay quarterback a grade for the year. And he has made a strong point that he was still giving Brett Favre very good grades in the three years leading up to the drafting of Aaron Rodgers. That, to Bob McGinn, was more of a blindside shot where he did not see that one coming because it wasn't needed yet when they took Aaron Rodgers with the 24th overall pick because, remember, it was between him and Alex Smith. Might go number one out of Cal, and he fell, 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 and finally Ted Thompson said, I, I got to do this. I got to pull this trigger at 24. But his point was, in the three previous seasons to that, Brett Favre, if we go back, it goes 04, 03, 02. Brett Favre's grades were B plus, B plus, and B. So, so Brett Favre had still been playing at a very high level. But Bob McGinn points out, Shannon, that Aaron Rodgers has been, according to Bob McGinn, pedestrian over the last three seasons with grades of C plus, C plus, and B over the last three years. And I told you the stats are saying decline, decline, decline. And so again, it's more necessary now to replace Aaron Rodgers than it was necessary back in 05 to start thinking about replacing Brett Favre. So I think I first guessed this. I think I saw this coming. I get what they're doing. I'm just not sure they're doing it with the next Aaron Rodgers because I'm not sure Jer that Jordan Love is going to be Aaron Rodgers. <clears throat> Skip, let's take what you said last, is that the last three years that he had given Brett Favre B+, plus, B+, plus, B+, plus, in his last three years, he's given Aaron Rodgers C+, plus, C-, minus, or D, or whatever it was. Now, two of those three years, Aaron Rodgers was hurt, broke his collarbone, so I don't know how you definitively give him a grade. And the next year, he hurts his knee in the very first game. And so I don't know how you give him the definitive grade when you know that he's injured. Second of all, and third of all, last year, Brett Favre, in those two years, he never had a season like what, Brett, like what Aaron had last year. You know that, I know that. And Brett never reached the NFC Championship game again. Aaron Rodgers have gone, just, just left the NFC Championship game. They got run off the field. That's what did happen. They got run off the field in the last game of the year up in, uh, up in uh, San Francisco, uh, Levi Stadium. That's what it's called, Levi. That's what did happen. Skip, the problem that I have with you is that when we go back and look at Aaron's run and the game that he's won, you always try to minimize him. You talk about he beat Joe Webb or you talk about he beat that guy, but you never say about when, Aaron, when uh, Tom Brady beat Phillip Rivers with a torn ACL or when he ble beat Blake Bortles, or when he beat David Garrard. It's always, Skip, you can't minimize. All you can do is play who's on the other side, regardless who the quarterback is. Yes, Tom Brady has beaten um, Peyton Manning in some Super Bowls, he, uh, not, um, in the AFC Championship games, to get some Super Bowls. Yes, he's beaten some good guys in Super Bowls. But, Skip, you can't minimize what Aaron Rodgers has been able to do. He's been great, basically, since he stepped on the field as the starting quarterback. And since you said uh, all of his numbers is going down and he's not the same, is that why Tom Brady jumped ship? Is that why he went and linked up with Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Cameron Brate and O.J. Howard? Is that why he did that? Because he needs help. He's not the same guy. All of a sudden, he doesn't have the strength to pull guys along. 
that might not be Randy Moss or top tier talent? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Because I, I just need to know because all the numbers that you threw out, okay, completion uh, percentage, yeah, uh, I, I QBR. Go ahead. Uh, time out. Last year, Tom Brady's receivers were dead last in the National Football League in separation. And his go-to receiver was a broken-down, beat-up Julian Edelman, aging and leading the league in drop passes. And yes, I believe Tom Brady looked at what was left in New England and said, this is horrible. This is only going to get worse. And I think it has gotten worse through free agency and the draft, thanks to Bill Belichick. We're going to talk about that a little later in the show. But I, yeah, I think Tom Brady finally woke up and said, I can't win with this. I'll, I'll go there. My coach is trying to put, push what? me out the back door anyway. So, and I told you the other day, maybe it's about time for Aaron Rodgers to start looking elsewhere. Oh, really, Skip? Is that what goals do? They look around and say, I can't win here, and they leave? Because you told me Michael Jordan would have never done that. You told me Michael Jordan stayed. When it got rough in Chicago, he stayed, and he won there, and that's why a lot of people give him credit. Now, all of a sudden, the GOAT, he looks around and says, I can't win with this? Really? Oh, that's news to me, and yeah. I'm glad you said that. Well, it's not news to you because you're the first to admit Bill Belichick's been trying to sabotage Tom Brady, make it harder and harder on <laughs> Tom Brady. He cost him that Super Bowl against Nick Foles when Bill Belichick gave up 41 points to the backup quarterback for the Eagles. And Tom Brady said, I can't live with this anymore because he's trying to make it as hard on me as he can. You've been the first to admit that. So, yeah, at age 42 after 20 years, Tom Brady finally said, that's enough. I don't see near the decline in Tom Brady. I didn't see any decline. I definitely see decline in Aaron Rodgers. And I don't know what you're talking about. Brett Favre never had a season like Aaron Rodgers had last year. I think that's what you said. No. I mean, Brett Favre no, left no, 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 Green no, Bay and had a great season in Minnesota. No, 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 Skip. I'm saying the seasons that he's talking about. Skip, Brett was an MVP, so clearly he had some great seasons. But Brett Favre was a turnover machine. There's a reason why he led the why he is the all-time career interception leader. He's thrown more interceptions than any other quarterback in the history of the game. Skip, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when he when he's evaluated, Mr. McGinn says he evaluated Brett Favre, what was it, 2003, 4, and 5. If you look at those seasons, it's hard for me to believe that they were better than what Aaron Rodgers just put on tape this past season. That's what I'm saying. No, I'm not saying Brett Favre never had a great season. Clearly, he was an MVP. He won a Super Bowl. He's a multiple-time league MVP. So, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying the seasons that which he evaluated. And last year, what we're talking about right here with uh, Aaron Rodgers, it's hard for me to believe without going back and looking at it and fully evaluating it says, oh, yeah, Brett Favre played better than Aaron Rodgers did last year. No, I, it's hard for me to believe that, Skip. And put, no, what the Packers did get tired of of Brett Favre every year threatened to retire and not come into OTAs and not come into minicamp. They did get tired of that. Okay, well, I'm here to assert that LaFleur is tired of Aaron's act. That's what McGinn is writing about. <laughs> Remember the Bleacher Report story of about a year ago? Yes. Remember the big bombshell about all things Packers, but especially about Aaron? And again, I've always mm -hmm. told you what I don't like about him is he can be a, a blame deflecting, finger pointing diva. He's got a lot of that in him. And I think you've agreed with that on occasion. Yeah. I know Greg Jennings mm -hmm. has, yes. who, who caught passes from Aaron, has been on Undisputed a lot, has agreed with parts of that. And that bombshell mm -hmm. story had the line that, that said that the, the president and CEO, remember, called Aaron to tell him. I have chosen Matt LaFleur. Like, he didn't ask his permission. Right. He said, I'm hiring right. this young coach. He's going to be your coach. So he said, according to the article, don't you be the problem. Don't be the problem going forward. And again, it, um, what's his name? Uh, Mike Murphy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he said, you know, Mark he Murphy. denied that he said that. But the, Mark. Uh, Mark Murphy. I'm sorry, Mark Murphy. Yeah, who played, obviously for uh, the Redskins. Mm -hmm. Mark Murphy yes. said, I didn't say it, but, but it sounded like semantically saying, well, I said something like that. 
And I think he did because they don't want Aaron to continue to be the problem. And I believe he was still the problem in their eyes last year and that they are telling Bob McGinn that off the record behind the scenes. And so he's saying they're sick and tired of this. They want some new leverage to try to keep Aaron under wraps, you know, sort of, if you will, under thumb, make him a little more coachable. And one way to make him more coachable is to say, well, guess what? We have your successor right here in house. We don't have to go trade for him or sign him in free agency. We got him right here right now. So maybe you should be a little more amenable to our new philosophy, which I think next year is going to be run the football. Well, Skip, for me, when I look at it, I don't think you it's hard for you to gain leverage over a guy when he knows if you trade it, it wrecks your salary cap. If you cut it, it wrecks your salary cap. And you've just given him $79 million in total guarantees. Now, Skip, I will concede this. The fact of the matter is that Aaron Rodgers is who he is, and they go hire a coach without telling him or not getting his blessings. That was a message. That was a more resounding of a message to me than this for the simple fact, Skip. Now, if they had not extended Aaron Rodgers and they still move up in the draft and select a quarterback, now you have Aaron Rodgers' undivided attention. Skip, with this, he knows, man, I would wreck your cap. Skip, look, their team, and we know teams will eat money. They'll eat 10, they'll eat $15 million. Skip, I don't know a team that's willing to eat $40 million, $50 million, even if you spread it out over two years. So that's what they would be up against. And you, up against. And you know, Skip, when you trade a guy, Skip, even Aaron Rodgers at his age, you're never going to get equal value because they know the team know that you're trading to knows that you're trying to get rid of him. So why am I going to give you full market value for a guy that you want to get rid of? I hear you, and I agree with that. Right now, he's virtually untradeable. There are probably <laughs> yes. ways out of this after one more year. But right now, yes. the, again, Jordan Love, at best, he's a project. He's like Aaron was coming mm -hmm. out of Cal in the Jeff Tedford system. Correct. They had to completely rebuild his delivery, and they had the luxury of three more Brett Favre years before Aaron even got right. his baptismal season as a starting quarterback. Maybe we're on right. that kind of track with Jordan Love. I don't okay. know. But we'll, the, the, the bottom line to this is, the clock has started ticking on Aaron Rodgers. I think sooner than later, they want him gone. And I do think it's going to be a very awkward situation next year as they try to, to morph more into a Derrick Henry-style running football team like what we saw from Tennessee down the stretch. I think you're going to see that from Green Bay next year. Yes, Skip, I agree with you because normally what happens when a quarterback of Aaron Rodgers' caliber, normally when you make offensive moves, you normally run that by the quarterback. And for them to not only not run it by the, run it by the quarterback, hell, they took a quarterback. So they really say, we, we don't give a bleep what you think. This is what we're going to do yeah. because we feel this is in the best interest of the team. So, Skip, yeah, I, I do think, I don't know if this, Skip, it's a power struggle. But I do believe they have Aaron Rodgers' undivided attention. <laughs> yeah, I think he's paying attention. That is definitely a good point. No mercy. As the Michael Jordan versus LeBron James GOAT debate rages on, Dennis Rodman weighed in when asked if he could guard LeBron, and Rodman didn't hesitate with a simple yes. Rodman continued saying LeBron is, quote, so easy to play and that he would have shut him down because his game is simple and all he can do is drive and use his size. Rodman also said Scottie Pippen would have shut down LeBron before Rodman would have even had to guard him. Shannon, I cannot wait for a reaction here. Is this fact or fiction? <laughs> this is bull jive. That's not what I really wanted to say, <laughs> but we know what it is, Skip Bayless. And you see what happens, Skip? Now, all of a sudden, Somebody's flipped over a wood pile and they let critters come crawling out and here come Dennis Rodman. He's got his 15 minutes of fame again because of the last documentary. And that's what we've seen, Skip Bayless. You know that, I know that. Nobody was even thinking about Dennis Rodman until he played a preeminent role in this last series of The Last Dance. And then all of a sudden, oh yeah, remember me? I was on that 98 Bulls team too. And this is what I was able to do. Man, stop it. Rodman, you were an unbelievable player. 
and I've argued with Skip Bayless on your behalf that you were a made man before you even teamed up with Michael Jordan. Two defensive players of the year, two uh, 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 chips. And so with two uh, defensive player of the year, two chips, and the rebounding title, uh, you were a made man. Skip, people don't know this. Dennis Rodman at 6'8 had two seasons in which he averaged 18 rebounds a game. One year he was 18.7. So I'm not saying Dennis Rodman wasn't great. Yes, he was a Hall of Famer before he even went to the Bulls. But he even stopped this. Let me tell you about some of the other great defenders that we would say great defenders. Now, this is what Iggy. Iggy won finals MVP, Skip, and LeBron James averaged 36, 13, and 9. Against Draymond, over four finals, he's 33, 11, and 9. Against Kawhi. Now, Kawhi is a tremendous defender. Many say he's the best defender right now in basketball, comparable to Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. In game, uh, uh, the finals in which LeBron won the MVP, he was 32, 11, 10, and 11 in game six, 32, and 37, and 12 in game seven. And in the finals that they lost, and people say, oh, LeBron was terrible. He was 28, 8, and 7 on 57% shooting against Kawhi. And oh, yeah, Paul George, that other great defender that they got out in L.A., he, over four series, he's 28, 8, and 6. Skip, what guys got to understand, Skip, and I try to do a great job when I go back and talk to guys in the Hall of Fame, Skip, because like I said, everybody believes the era in which they played in was the best. But I say, guys, there's this thing called evolution. Guys are getting bigger, they're getting faster, they're getting stronger. Guys in the NBA, Skip, they're getting taller, they're getting more skill. We, we rave about Larry Bird shooting the ball. Golden State had three guys on their roster that could shoot the, the ball every bit as good as Larry Bird. Steph, KD, and Clay. That's three guys on one team, and we know what Larry Bird was. And he said, like, yeah, I lock up KD too. Man, stop. Skip, the man is seven foot tall, shooting the ball at a 10 foot apex. You're not locking anybody up, Skip. I get, I get it, Skip. I would have my face. Hey, well, since we're talking about what we can do hypothetically, you know what? I want LT one-on-one -on -one and block it. When he rushing the quarterback, John Elway, I want LT. I'm going to lock him up. And by the way, rest this on Reggie White, I got something for him too. Man, stop this, Dennis. You were great in your time. Let these guys have their moment. You ain't locking no great defender is locking up another great offensive player. That's not what they do. And this notion, Skip, you remember everybody says, ooh, Bill Russell, he locked down Chamberlain. All Chamberlain did was average was 28 and 28. And for over 100, and four, over 100 plus games, Will Chamberlain was 28 points, 28 rebounds. That's what he averaged against Russell. Is that shutting down? Because I guarantee you, if a guy averaged 28 and 28 right now, he's going to win the MVP every year no matter what his record is, if he puts up those kind of numbers. So, no, Dennis Rodman out his mind, which he probably was, when he made that statement. Shannon Sharp. This Last Dance documentary has been your last dance and LeBron's last dance on your GOAT debate <clears throat> that you try to make so pathetically every day on this show. And now... You say somebody's scurrying out from under the wood pile. Dennis Rodman yep. was not just a good, he was a great defender. And I want the kids out there in, in our viewer land to look beneath the wild hair colors that you're seeing on Last Dance and beneath the nose rings and the nail polish and all the stories about Madonna and Carmen Electra. Dennis Rodman was rare. He was special in ways I've never seen anybody be special. And when he says he could shut down LeBron, I believe he would make life miserable for LeBron at his defensive peak. And I'm talking about with the bad boy Pistons. Yes, he would have caused huge problems for LeBron James. The reason being, at 6'8", I'd never seen anybody stronger at 6'8", just naturally gifted stronger, who played any stronger than Rodman did at 6'8", which is about an inch shorter, only an inch shorter than LeBron. And Dennis Rodman at 6'8", had 
extremely high basketball IQ on par with LeBron's, except Dennis's was defensive and rebounding IQ. He was sly, smart in ways I'd never seen before a defensive rebounding player be. He was a below-the-rim rebounder. He was not a, an explosive leaper, but he was very quick on his feet, and he always beat you to the spot on defense and under the basket for the, the carom, for how the ball was going to bounce. So when, when he says that LeBron's game is simple, he's right. Because let's be honest about this. LeBron didn't have that cat quickness that Michael Jordan had. Michael could separate. He could, he could just shake and bake you and separate from you in, in a flash. And LeBron has never had that. And he said he has only one move. Well, I, what have I always said about LeBron? Greatest attacker of the basket I've ever seen. But it's very simple because it's just straight head, straight line explosion. He's not going to fake you off your feet. He's not going to, so to speak, make you miss. He's not going to blow by you because you're fooled. He's just going to freight train past you and beat you with strength and then skill at the basket because LeBron is ambidextrous left or right-handed at the basket and has great touch at the basket. What LeBron is in the main is he's an all-time great passer, but, but he's an average at best jump shooter, mostly below average given his superstardom. <clears throat> and he's a lousy free throw shooter and Dennis would lock right in on that because Dennis studied, Dennis researched. And what you forget Dennis played with a nasty edge unlike we see anybody play defense today. He was the all-time greatest irritant, distractor, the crown prince pest that we've ever had in the history of this game. And once he got under your skin, he would snatch your poise, he would snatch your wits, and ultimately he would snatch your heart right out of your body. And that's what would start happening to LeBron if Dennis guarded him. And I made the case to you, Shannon, we were talking about Shaq, Kobe, Lakers versus the 98 Bulls. And I told you, well, on defense, the Bulls would just put one of their seven footers, Luke Longley, Bill Winnington, at the rim. And then they would put Rodman on Shaq. And he would bother Shaq because he's way stronger than you think he is. And he's going to get his hands on the ball. He, he is different uh, uh, as a defender in, in ways that I've never seen before. So he would, yes, he would plague LeBron James because he would match him in physicality. And he would basically say, you can't beat me jump shooting. So I'm going to make you drive it on me. And then I'm going to match you at the rim in, in IQ and in strength. I'll be right there with you step for step. And, and it would frustrate Le LeBron, Skip. and it would ultimately drive him right over the edge. So, yes, Dennis Rodman is not just spouting off. He's not just trying yeah, to recapture another 15 minutes of fame. He's flat yeah. out telling you the straight truth. Skip, you just said that Dennis Rodman was a below the rim. LeBron plays above the rim, even in year 17. Now, what we're seeing is that he only has... Think about this, Skip. Kareem only had one move. Kareem only had one move, Skip Bayless. How would that work out for him? 38,000 points with one move. What? Uh, Wait, how many out. touchdowns? Can I say something? Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, re real quick. Did you see in the last dance footage, did you see what Rodman did to Kareem as a piston? Did you see that sequence? where he blocked Kareem Skip. twice in a row, and Kareem's standing Skip. there gaping oh. like, what, what just happened? Skip. A 6'8 guy just if blocked me, me twice. Asking. Skip, Skip, if you don't mind me asking, can you tell the people what year was that for Kareem in which Dennis Rodman blocked his shot? Tell the people at home what year was that for Kareem. You're 20. You know what it I was, I don't know Skip which year Bayless. it was. Do you? Probably 1990. No, Kareem, Kareem was gone then. Skip, you, ooh, Skip Bayless, you ought to be ashamed no. of yourself. You really should be ashamed of yourself, Skip. You really should. You know good and well. LeBron James. So I, this is what I don't understand. LeBron can get to the rim against Kawhi. He can get to the rim against Paul George. He can get to the rim against Andre Iguodala. But he couldn't get to the rim against Dennis Rodman. 
Now, you said these guys are some of the great defenders of all time. Paul George, they said, we've never seen anything like Paul George and Kawhi. And LeBron just, LeBron just, just took both of them to school. LeBron, as a matter of fact, Bron homeschooled okay, them out. two guys before we even had quarantine. He had Paul George and Kawhi homeschooled. Like, y'all ain't got to go to school today. Work from your computer. And now you over there talking about, now Dennis Rodman going to talk about he can lock up LeBron. I have only said that Kawhi and Paul George and Iguodala are the best defenders of their era, but they have none of the physicality that Dennis brought to pro basketball out of southeastern Oklahoma State, out of nowhere. Right. And right. to me, he, he changed the game, the way it was played. He was the one setting the tone for the bad boy Pistons because 1990-91, he was the defensive player of the year, as you pointed out. And in 92, he led all of basketball in defensive win shares. So for three years, he was the best defensive player on the planet, setting the tone, the bad boy tone, playing in the gray area where he was trying every trick in the book to distract you, to get under your skin and into your heart. That's what he did best. So physical, so, words, so nasty, so I don't give a you-know-what. He didn't care who you were. He didn't care if it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or it's Kareem nobody. He did not care. He's just going to take the ball out of your hands, which is what he did. So in other words, he's a bigger Lance Stevenson, uh, Pat Bev. That's what Dennis Rodman is, a bigger, more physical Lance Stevenson, Patrick Beverly. Is that what you're saying? Oh, he's got some Pat Bev in him, except he's 6'8 and much stronger and more physical than Pat Bev. Yeah. But that, that bulldog and, mentality that Pat Bev has, yes, that was Dennis Rodman. And the antics of Lance Stevenson. Skip, you remember how he's blowing in his ear, how he's looking at him, how he's doing all those more, Mainly, Skip, when he yeah. was in Indiana. When, when LeBron, when LeBron, okay. when LeBron I, I, was in uh, uh, Miami. Yeah, no, I, I got it. No, no, that's, that's a good analogy, except Lance couldn't back it up. Lance did it during timeouts. He's going to blow in your ear. Dennis would do all of those things during timeouts, tug on your shorts. And you, I, don't, I don't think he ever untied anybody's shoes, but he would do those kinds of things in timeouts. Then he would back it up when the ball was in play. Yeah. Lance couldn't back it up. Skip, we know, this is what we know. Even the greatest defenders against the greatest offensive guys, you just hope to contain the numbers. If the guy gets 35, you just hope you can hold him under that. This notion that a de great defender can stop a great offensive guy, you can't, Skip. You just can't. And this is why, it, you know, you just hope that we can get offset. Okay, LeBron going to give us 30. KD will probably match that, give us somewhere between 30, 32. Kawhi's going to get his. Guy, the great players are going to get theirs. You just hope you can offset some of that. This notion that he says he's going to lock him up, which means uh, you ain't getting nothing today. You're going to have like 15 points. Man, stop. Stop. Skip, you don't have to embellish it. Dennis Rodman was a great defender. I'm not denying that. Dennis Rodman was a hell of a player. And guess what? They would not have won the second three-peat without Rodman. You know that. Everybody knows that. Because for seven straight years, Dennis Rodman led the re league in rebounding. For this minute, seven straight. I know you can't see it because you don't have a monitor. Seven straight. And he was two-time defensive player of the year. So in other words, he was a main man before he met Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan didn't make him. So that's notion. But this is where he leaves me. This is where I want to get off the ship. Because it's about to get rocky and something might happen. I don't want no parts of it. When he starts talking about he going to lock LeBron up, he can lock KD up too. Man, they need, yeah. If they lock you up, they got a better chance. Locking KD up, locking LeBron up. Skip, do you realize these are generational players? This ain't just some willy-nilly guy. You're talking about some of the all-time greats. He, As a matter of fact, yeah. one of the guys you're talking about, the GOAT. One guy is the GOAT. Not the GOAT. Yeah, let's, let's do talk coming. about the real GOAT, not the phony GOAT. The real GOAT, Michael Jordan, was the greatest mid-range jump shooter in the history of pro basketball. He scored yes. these the vast majority of his points, mid-range jump shots, fadeaways, hang, 
hold the Beautiful. pose, make it. Off the glass. You separate the way nobody could separate from defenders. And LeBron, this was the first time Dennis Rodman in, in his sort of, you know, in, in, in his simplicity of speech, he's, he's not the most eloquent guy, but he called LeBron, games, uh, LeBron James' game simple. And that's the first time it dawned on me that's simply brilliant from Dennis Rodman because LeBron doesn't have a lot of whipped cream going on. LeBron doesn't have a way to just completely separate by shooting mid-range jump shots. He's not a very good mid-range jump shooter. He doesn't have that in his rep repertoire. He's either going to pull up and be hot cold from three, mostly cold, because he's a career 34% three-point shooter, or he's going to drive it. And mostly in his era, he's been able to bully every defender who ever tried to guard him. He can get to the rim at will. It's why I pull my hair out at night watching him. I just say, drive it, attack. But he's been afraid of the late game free throw line because he's oh, a way that. below it's... average free throw shooter. Well, he is. It's just a fact. Dennis would lock on to that. Dennis might send LeBron to the line a record number of times in a game, but Dennis would trust, well, he's only going to make like 65% of those, so I'll live with the 65% as opposed to KD, who can make 90% of his free throws. Dennis would have a hard time with Kevin Durant. I do not think Dennis could lock up Kevin Durant. There's way too much stuff going on. Kevin's game is not simple. He's seven feet, and he's got wingspan of 7'5". That's hard to guard. LeBron is much easier to guard yeah. than Kevin Durant. Skip. Skip. You do realize Dennis Rodman only has uh, only has six fouls, so it's not like he can just keep putting LeBron on the line on, on the line because his butter be out of the game. So this notion that oh he can get physical, well how physical? Skip obviously back it, a lot's going to depend on the era in which they play because you know back in the '80s and the '90s they let the guys play a little more. Now the sp the floor is spaced, guys have more lanes to be able to get to the basket, uh, and now guys want to shoot the three. So a lot of that is, is, is predicated, but Skip, we'll, we'll never know. It's, e it's easy to say that now. I mean, I would love to, you know, run routes on some of the guys, Mel Blunt and some of the great safety, Paul Kraus, all those guys back there. But Skip, that's wishful thinking. Dennis, you did what you did. Now go on back, now go back to sleep and, and, and leave the gold alone. The gold busy. We working on our documentary. Because from moving forward, Skip Bayless, you know we got cameras following us for the next four years. Because we're on this quest. All-time lead score and two more chips. That's what we got for the people. The phony goat is getting exposed <laughs> by the last dance. And I, for one, am ecstatically happy about it. Oh, Ain't nobody taking Dennis Rodman never series. going to miss an opportunity to speak his mind. No mercy. Reports have emerged that Bill Belichick may be willing to have a bumpy 2020 season in hopes of landing Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence in next year's draft. Belichick didn't draft a QB this year. Remember that. So, Shannon, can you see any truth to this report? Hell no. Skip, Coach Belichick has won 11 games for a decade straight. 11 games for a decade straight. And so or, in order for him to get in position to be able to have an opportunity to take uh, Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields or whomever, Skip, he's going to have to go, what, 2-14, and 3-13, and 13, probably worst-case scenario, maybe even 1-15 and 15, to be in position to make sure. Because I believe the top two quarterback, the, uh, Lawrence and Fields, probably go 1-2. We, we can debate later on. I'm sure we have that debate later on, Skip, in the order they're going to go. But we feel they're the best, the top two quarterbacks that's coming out. So Coach Belichick. A guy that's gone to nine Super Bowls, 12 AFC Championship games, is going to say, you know what? The hell with it, guy. Let's, hey, we just need to be in position. Skip, the one thing that we know about players and coaches when they're great, I don't want to be around for no rebuild. When you get used to winning, that's all you want to do. There have been very few coaches that want to stay around for a rebuild. Skip, you remember Doc Rivers when the Celtics broke up the big three and they were going to get ready for a rebuild? Doc said, guys, I sure wish y'all would help me get up out of here. And what did they do? They obliged him? No, no, hell. That's not even, I, I can't even imagine a scenario. Now, Skip, it might, be, it might be a situation where they're just not good. 
and they don't win but five, six games. But I don't believe even that will put them in position to get a quarterback. And because the quarterback is so touted, ain't, there's no one going to let the Patriots move up and be in position to get one of those top quarterbacks. That's not going to happen. When they say there's a lot of envy and jealousy, why would I, after that 20-year stranglehold y'all just had on the NFL, we think you, we want you to let you get in position to get another quarterback so you can have another five, 10-year stranglehold? Absolutely not. I do not believe Coach Belichick is going to tank in order to get in the position to take Trevor Lawrence. That's not his makeup. That's not how he's wired. Okay, let me ask you this. Yes. Show me one move Bill Belichick has made in free agency or in the draft that made you say, wow, that's interesting. The move that I see, Skip, is that he's going to play the exact same way he played last year. He believes he can have a number one scoring defense, play it close to the vest, because he said, hell, it wasn't like Tom won me games last year, because anytime the team hit over 17, we lost. Anytime we hold the team under that, we won. Hell, if Jared Stidham should be able to get us, you know, 14 to 17 points and have us win games. But, Skip, you actually think Coach Belichick, after he's done all that winning, is that he's going to be okay with losing, just basically throwing the season away to get in position? Because remember, Skip, he doesn't believe it's about the players. He believes it's about his system. That's why he was willing to dismiss and put no effort into re-signing Tom Brady. He thinks it's him. He thinks it's his system. Bingo. And I believe he's going to get exposed without Tom Brady. So I look hard. I'm watching. I'm waiting. I'm trying to see what the plan is here for Bill Belichick to, to sort of reload on the fly. I don't see a plan. I agree with you. It seems like a long shot that Bill Belichick would suddenly go 2-14 and 14 next year. But every move he's made through free agency and the draft has a 2-14 and 14 kind of feel to me. <laughs> and it sure appears that unless he's got one more ace up his sleeve that, that I can't see, the ace could be sign Cam Newton, which I do not see, or it could be trade for Andy Dalton, and I still don't understand unless Andy Dalton would completely destroy his contract and start over for next to no money. I don't know. I, I don't even see how you could pay Andy Dalton and wedge him under what's left under your cap, which is not much. So it, it smacks of he's either going to start Brian Hoyer, who he's fond of, who he would trust short term. This is obviously Brian Hoyer's third time around in New England. Brian Hoyer has been a starter in this league, and at times he's been a decent starter. But it appears to me he wants to show the world he can win with the kid he already calls the nickname Stid. I've never heard Bill Belichick have a nickname for anybody, let alone a kid who hasn't really played, played briefly against the Jets, threw a pick six to Jamal Adams, and Belichick had to yank him and put Brady back in in garbage time of a blowout of the Jets? Really? So he's calling him Stid, Jared Stidham. I told you, I watched him a lot at Baylor, watched him even more at Auburn. He's got some talent. He's got some athletic ability. I didn't see the poise under fire. And you're going to throw that kid into this fire post Tom Brady to step into those winged cleats? Man, you're asking. That, that's the all-time recipe for disaster. And maybe... To the point of this speculation, maybe that's what he wants. It's either that or this. Is it possible he's trying to say, I am the greatest. I'm so great. I'm, I'm even underrated great where I'm going to show you I'm not even going to try in free agency. I'm really not even going to try in the draft because I thought he would manipulate and dominate the draft in ways that never materialized. He traded out of number 23. So he, he could have had Jordan Love at 23 and he passed. And he could have had Jalen Hurts in the second round and he passed. And, and then he could have had Jacob Eason three times in the third round and he passed, passed, passed. So it appears he's just telling the world, no, 
I can win with my fourth rounder that I took two years ago, Stid, Stid you know, Jared Stidham. And I can win <laughs> with a bunch of guys you've never heard of. Uh, my first pick in the draft is going to be out of Lenore Ryan, Division Two, And I'll show you. I can make it work with him and everybody, all the other no-names that I picked. And, and if, if he did, if he makes the playoffs with what's left in his cupboard right now, he's going to be coach of the year. And that would be the first time he's been coach of the year in 10 years. So he's setting himself up right. for that. Or... He's setting himself up for a reload, sort of rebuild pass. Maybe he's planning excuses. Maybe he says, I need a year to wait and see if I can get a quarterback I love a year from now, whether it's going to be Trevor Lawrence or Fields or whoever it is. Who knows? Maybe he just said, I need a year to start to rebuild my, my whole culture post Tom Brady. And if that's the case, I told you early on, I'm not going to give him a pass. You call him the GOAT, I no. don't. But, you know, if no. he's the GOAT, he, he, he deserves no pass. He's not going to get any breaks from no. me. If he goes 2-14, and 14, you're going to hear about it from me because I don't think it's a, pl a master plan. I think he's just going to get exposed. Yeah, Skip, for me, I don't, I don't feel like I said, if they win five or six games, it's not going to be like they weren't trying to win more. They just got beat. But, Skip, if you look at what they did, they look seems to me they tried to get younger on defense. And some of the older players, the Kyle Van Oys, the uh, Jamie Collins, some of these other guys, they traded to Ron Harmon. Um, some of the other guys, Skip, they allowed to leave via free agency, uh, Danny Shelton. It seems to me they tried to infuse this defense with younger talent and they want to play that brand of football again. We're number one in defense, and we're going to keep the games. I mean, the games are going to be a lot closer this year, Skip, because, you know, they were suffocating, and they blew, ended up blowing some people out. So the games might be closer this year because, obviously, Jared Stidham is not Tom Brady, even at Tom Brady's age of 42, going to be 43 to start the season. But I just believe that Coach Belichick believes he can win with that style of football again. Let's be number one in scoring defense. Let's minimize the turnovers. Okay, Josh, you're going to have to earn your money this year. Coach him up. Let's go out there, and we're going to win eight, nine games, and we'll see if that's good enough to get us in the playoffs. But I don't to think that Coach Belichick all of a sudden is going to be okay with going 2-14, and 3-13 and 13 after nine trips to the Super Bowl, 12 ASC ch uh, championship games, Skip. Hell no. Shannon, Julian Edelman looked washed up last year. You love him going into this coming year. And Sony Michelle, <laughs> he, he was in the doghouse two-thirds of the year last year. Do you love him next year? I, I, I don't know. James White looked like he was an older player last year. You love that going uh, forward? The and, offensive you know, line had a lot whoa, of leaks in a, it last year. Wait a minute. I, I don't see it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Skip. Hold on. And guys that are 24, 25 looking old. Hell, they got a quarterback that's about to be 40, but that was 42, and he looked like he was 22. Man, stop this, Skip. Everybody gets blamed. I noticed what you said. It was James White. When James White was catching passes, oh, James White special. Son of Michelle, legend, rushing uh, uh, two years ago, legend to the Super Bowl. Now, all of a sudden, it's everybody's fault except Tom Brady. Man, that's ridiculous. Mm. I sure like Tom Brady's chances next year. Yeah, oh. oh. I'm liking them more and more. I might just be coming a Bucks fan right now. Why not? I'm here for Tom. No mercy. So Charles Barkley continued his feud with Draymond Green. When asked about Green's latest jab, that he'd be coming for Chuck's job, Barkley said Draymond is the least important member of a boy band, but doesn't even realize it. Barkley said this while appearing on John Calipari's Facebook show. Shannon, any truth? to what Barkley is saying. This thing won't end. <laughs> but, Skip, I wish, they let, I wish they let this go, Skip, uh, <laughs> because I think now it's becoming personal, more personal than it should. Uh, I, I understand that Charles has a job to do. His job is critique and analyze, but I think when you start to, to make comments like that, and Draymond has gotten personal also, I think but what we're having here, Skip, is that neither player feels that they're being given proper credit for their contributions.
Skip, and, and I know Charles Barkley retired in, 20, in, in 2000. I, I remember Charles Barkley's career very well. And people, Skip, they look at him now, and he's really out of shape, and I'm being nice about it. Uh, he's had, his, I think, his hip replaced, and he walks, and people just think, oh, he just, he's just a blowhard. Skip, do people realize Charles Barkley was a hell, hell, hell of a player? Charles Barkley is one of six players, let this sink in right now, Skip, one of six players to end his career averaging at least 22 points and 11 rebounds. Here are the others, Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Elgin Baylor, Bob Pettit, and George Mikan. He ended his career 22 and 11. Charles Barkley was six foot four and was a power forward. So in other words, he's the height of some point guard and two guards. He played power forward in the 80s and the 90s, and he did that. So he looks at it like, Draymond, bruh, you keep telling everybody that you're better than me, bruh, and no way, shape, or form are you better than me. And I agree with Charles. Draymond, you won three titles. You're defensive player of the year. You're not a better player than Charles Barkley. And that's the notion, Skip. Sometimes people, the third, fourth, fifth best player on a championship team win championships and they believe because a guy that's an all-time great didn't win a championship, they're greater than them. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not. Skip, I look at it like this, and I, I'll take my career. Draymond, this is what I do for you. When I look at my career, Skip, I had a very good career, Skip. Um, I went to Pro Bowls. I was an All-Pro. I won three Super Bowls. I'm in the Hall of Fame. Skip, I was not more important than TD. I was not more important than John Elway. But that's okay. Just because I was not as important as those guys, do I believe they could have won a Super Bowl without me? No. I'm not more important than Ray Lewis and those guys on that defense. But do I believe they could have won a Super Bowl without me? No. That's okay. Draymond, you're not Steph. You're not Clay. You're not KD. But I don't believe they could have won a championship without you. That's okay. Skip, th th they're level to this. You can be in a, and, and Charles used the band. <laughs> he say, bro, you up there yelling and screaming. Then you don't realize they can't see Justin Timberlake. You just happen to be in the group that's with Justin Timberlake, that Justin Timberlake sings in. And it, is, it was funny, Skip, but they're getting personal now. You know, it's, and Charles is not going to let it go. Draymond's not going to let it go. So I don't know when this thing's going to end. But Charles is right, Skip. Draymond, I don't believe they would have won those titles without Draymond. But Draymond is trying to make himself more important than what he is. He was a great contributor. He's a defensive player of the year. But Skip, Steph and Clay and, and KD is where it's at. Okay. Quick point of order. I think we just heard the all-time humble brag from Shannon Sharp. I wasn't those guys, but they couldn't have won without me. But that's okay. I, I appreciated it. It was I sly. Skip, I don't part, believe they could have. The way you termed it. No. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I got no, it. I don't. All right, back to the question at hand. And I'm just going to keep it on these guys. I'm just going to talk about Charles and Draymond. I agree with you. It has gotten too personal. I'm not sure it's about player versus player in this case. But if you want to make it that, I'll give you Charles was much more productive than Draymond. I don't think Charles was a more valuable player than Draymond has been for his team. I never loved Charles winning intangibles because I think they were low. I think he could fill that stat sheet. He could stuff it like few have ever been able to at six feet, four inches tall, below the <laughs> rim rebounder, round mound of rebound, did a lot with that big caboose <laughs> behind him. But the point was, and he was a very gifted scorer, we know that, but when it came to winning time, as Magic termed it, uh, Charles often wasn't where he needed to be when he needed to be there. He couldn't be counted on like Draymond was counted on pre-KD. Remember, in that 2015-16 season, they set the record. They won 73 games, and Draymond mm -hmm. was extremely valuable to that team. Because to me, and I think this is getting lost in the shuffle of this scuffle, if you will, Draymond was the glue of that team. He was the guts of that yes. team. Yeah. Yes. He was, the inf he was the enforcer on that team. He was the, the yes. trash-talking bad cop. 
because Steph is the baby face and Clay is the super nice guy and Igadala is the all-around great guy. And it was a fun <laughs> team to be on, but you needed, when push came to shove, somebody who would shove. And Draymond yes. would shove. He would push back. And sometimes to a fault. I'll get to that in just a second. But if you look at that 2015-16 season, Draymond went 15 points, 10 rebounds, and 7 assists. Not huge numbers, but across the board, that, that's pretty great. That's very good. And as you know, the right. next year, he was the defensive player of the year, and he led the league in steals. So he had high value in little ways. That team right. needed somebody to do the dirty work, and he did all-star dirty work for them because he did make three all-star teams, and he yeah. did make first-team All-NBA a couple of times, and, and he was five times all-defense. Okay, that's all pretty great, you know? It's pretty great. Yeah. And I get, you know, okay, yes. so you're the, the, the one guy, you're the last member of the boy band. Well, the boy band's... They're, they're going to live forever. They're immortal, and so are you because you're on there. Right. But maybe but. you're singing something contralto. You know, they need somebody to blend in, somebody to harmonize. Right. And maybe you're the key piece of the harmony that, that the other guy, that Justin Timberlake needed. He sang high, you sang low. Okay? I, I get it. But let's not discount what he meant to that team. And by the way... When they did get to that fateful finals that saved your bacon and saved LeBron's when they came from three to one down to win it, one game seven at Oracle. Do you remember what happened at Oracle that night? Draymond Green Draymond was on fire. went 32, 15 rebounds, and nine assists. 32, nine assists. 15, and nine? Are you kidding me? That, that's sensational. He was in position, Shannon, to win MVP of the series if Steph could have made one big shot down the stretch in the fourth quarter. Remember what he did in the fourth quarter? He was just horrible. Like one for six from yeah. three and had the turnover. You know, he needed to make one big shot or Draymond needed to make one more shot. And Draymond would have been MVP of the finals to me. But what had happened in game four? Well, obviously, the best thing that ever happened to LeBron happened because Draymond lost it. He lost his poise. He lost his cool. He, he lost his self-control, and he got into it with LeBron, and he, he yelled out the B word at him. You are a B, and, and, and the first three rows of the stands could hear it. You, I can't remember if you could hear it on national TV. I think not. But Kiki Vandaway, who meted out the punishment for the NBA, was in mm -hmm. the first row, and he heard it loud and clear. And that's a line you can't cross. And Draymond had, you know, he'd already done some kicking in the, the groin region. Right. And he was mm -hmm. on the clock already with Kiki. And Kiki said, I'm, I'm going to suspend him. That's enough. And obviously they went up the court then and got into it again. And he kicked in LeBron's groin region. And that's it. And he is gone for game five. And, and I submit to you, I do not believe that your man, LeBron, could have come back from three to one down if Draymond had not been gone for game five. It turned the whole season around. The Golden State Warriors suddenly got exposed. They didn't have a lot of heart. They didn't have their backbone. They didn't have Draymond. And once the momentum turned, it turned like crazy, like gangbusters. And once LeBron and Kyrie seized the momentum and JR, it was over, man. They just blew through him from then on, and obviously Kyrie hit the final shot of Game 7, and the rest is NBA history. So, again, that's how valuable Draymond was. You saw how valuable when he wasn't there in Game 5. Right. So I just think getting lost in all this is, yeah, pre-KD, Draymond was a force on those Golden State Warriors. Right. Well, again, right. you tell the story again and again. He was the one who went in the parking lot crying and called KD and said, we can't do it without you. And then, of course, he became, ironically, the one who ran KD off by calling him the B-word early last season, two seasons <laughs> back now. But, Skip, Skip and that's, that's yeah. my point. I believe both guys feel that the other guy isn't giving them the recognition or the credit they deserve for the, during their careers because Draymond is making it seem like Charles Barkley was a bum because he didn't win a title. And, Dray, and, and, and uh, Charles is trying to make it seem like, Draymond, you just tagging along. 
you, you, hey, you're not the big brother that's going on a date. He just got to take you with him because his mom or dad won't let him hold a car without you in it. So they're like, hold on, wait a minute. Give me my credit. I just feel that Charles isn't giving him, giving Draymond the recognition that he deserves. Skip, look, we understand like Genesis was a great band. Peter Gabriel, I don't know how many people remember this. Peter Gabriel was the original lead singer. Phil Collins was on the drums. And then when he left, Phil moved to the mic. Well, Skip, you didn't know that, Skip? You didn't know that? Yeah! How did you know that? Peter Gabriel! You like yeah, Genesis? I, I'm bad. Yes! Yes, Boy, something's in the air tonight. I don't know what it is, but something's <laughs> in the air. That's Who good. knew? I'm not saying, I'm not saying, Skip. I think you're I'm getting saying, exposed. I'm not, <laughs> Skip, I'm not saying Draymond is Phil Collins. I'm not going that far, but I'm just saying, Skip, I don't believe the band could have been what it became without Phil Collins being there. Everybody plays a role. Skip, the Jackson 5, we know what the Jackson 5 was about. It was about Michael. But you had Jermaine, you had Jackie, you had Marlon, you had Tito. It took all of them. Now, did, do they get the credit that Michael got? Hell no. Nah. And they don't deserve the credit. Just like Draymond doesn't deserve the credit that Steph gets. That's okay, but I don't believe it could have functioned like it did without Draymond. Skip, like, and today, like, like I said, a lot of people just know me for doing this. And they're like, okay, yeah, he played football because, you know, when uh, I'll be looking for something and I'm like, well, this guy's better than you, and that tight is better. Skip, I ain't got nothing to prove. I did what I did. I'm done. If you want to say that guy that got two catches is better than me, okay, have at it. I did what I did. I can't add. You can't take away. Draymond, let it go, bro. You still going. You don't have to prove anything to Charles. Charles, you were all-time great player. Skip, you know what Charles represented. Charles was hell. Charles was an MVP. Skip, he still got one of the five or six highest scoring playoff games in NBA history. People don't realize Chuck dropped 56 in a playoff game one year. Ask Chris Webber about it. Ask him about it. Skip, you remember Charles right. Barkley was All a right. hell of a player. No, he was. I got that. My quick musical analogy for you, band analogy, is the Beatles were just okay. another band with Pete Best on the drums. It wasn't until they got Ringo, <laughs> Ringo. and replaced Pete Best Ringo set the tone and the rhythm for the Beatles to become the greatest rock group ever. So he, again, he's the, the least of the Beatles, but he was incredibly crucial to their success, as has Draymond been. Draymond, Ringo. Okay, Draymond. Okay, Draymond, you're Ringo. You're not McCartney, you're not Lennon, you're Ringo. You're no. important, but they okay. really, they were really coming to see, they were really coming to see uh, McCartney left-handed guitar and John Lennon on the keyboard. That's what they were coming to see. But they like a good drummer. I'm liking these music analogies. It all makes sense to me now. It was that easy. Thank you, guys. No mercy. Athletics. Bob McGinn covered the Packers for 38 years, and he had some interesting insights on why Green Bay could have drafted quarterback Jordan Love. McGinn writes that Matt LaFleur may have drafted another QB because he, quote, simply had enough of Aaron Rodgers' act. McGinn continued saying that the Packers wouldn't want Rodgers to, quote, become even more difficult to coach. Skip, are you buying this? <laughs> Shannon Sharp. Yes. I hate to say I told you so, but I did again and again and again. <laughs> I was the lone wolf out on my island Bayless Island, saying, time out, he's not what he used to be. The last three years, his stats have said declining, declining, declining. Last year, this past season, while they went 13 and three and they won a bunch of games where you said, how did they win that? I'm not sure. The other Aaron, Aaron Jones, was more valuable than Aaron Rodgers because Aaron Rodgers had his career low QBR, scale of 0 to 100. He had a 54. Not good. His completion percentage last year was 21st in the NFL. Not good. And apparently, the two men who now run the Green Bay Packers are seeing exactly what I've been saying and seeing. 
Gutekunds, the GM, Lafleur, the young head coach, are just saying, no, we've got to get out from under this because we're getting sick and tired of not only his production, but his attitude. And remember, Bob McGinn is the guru on this. Almost 40 years covering the Packers, the ultimate authority, the man who knows where all the bodies are buried, who knows the team from the inside out, is writing what I'm sure he's being told from the inside out, that young Lafleur is just saying, I, I had a year of him, and I'm just tired of the act. As McGinn calls it, the passive-aggressive act, which, what do I always say? Aaron Rodgers is the LeBron James of the NFL. Passive-aggressive. That's what we always hear about LeBron. Cryptic tweets, IG posts, little quotes to the media, Aaron via his radio gig. What's he mean by that? It's blame-deflecting, finger-pointing, it's diva act that Lafleur and probably Gutekunst, who obviously hired Lafleur, they're, they're getting sick and tired of it. They're stuck with a huge contract, and it's going to be very difficult to get out from under it. But they wanted to create new leverage with Aaron. They, they want to make him more manageable. So what did they do? They drafted the hottest X-Factor property on the draft market, Jordan Love. I told you, I, I have no idea. I didn't watch him enough to have a big, bold opinion, a yes or a no. Bob McGinn's research said more no than yes, and he knows a lot of people around the league and does a lot of great work pre-draft. So Bob McGinn's not sold on Jordan Love, but he's sold on the premise that the Packers are saying no to Aaron Rodgers. So... The premise for next year, according to a report in the Milwaukee Sentinel, uh, Journal Sentinel, is the that Sentinel. they're going to go to the big banger. They're going to go to the, the kid they drafted in the second round, A.J. Dillon, Boston College, 250 pounds, ran 4-5 at the combine. The next Derrick Henry, let's let him pound the rock. He's a straight-ahead banger. He's not a make-you-miss. He just punishes a defense and wears it down. And to do that, as we saw with Derrick Henry down the stretch with Ryan Tannehill, they took the ball out of Tannehill's hands for the most part and put it in Derrick Henry's, and he just beat defenses to a pulp and into submission. I think that's where the Packers are headed next year as they try to develop Jordan Love. So in the end, Bob McGinn sums it up by saying he gives the, the Packer quarterback a big grade every year, and he is a tough grader. And his point was he was giving Brett Favre much higher grades before they drafted Aaron Rodgers than he has been giving Aaron before they drafted Jordan Love because Aaron got what he called pedestrian grades the last two. He was C plus, C plus the last two years, B the year before, Brett Favre was B plus, B plus, B in the three years before they went to Aaron Rodgers. So he's saying, wait a second, they do need a new quarterback. Maybe it's not Jordan Love, but they needed somebody. And now they think they've got a hold over Aaron Rodgers, more leverage where they can say, well, if you don't like it, lump it. We'll just play the kid. So again, in decline, I've been telling you, and I think I'm right about this one. Oh, uh, Skip Bader. Boy, I love Skip Bader. Boy, you, Skip Bader, I love you like a cousin. But you will not tell the truth for the life of you when it comes to Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. Now, Skip Bader would have you believe that Aaron Rodgers has dropped off a cliff. Now, Aaron Rodgers dropped off a cliff. Tom Brady is still in the prime of his career. Aaron Rodgers' QBR was higher than Tom Brady's. Aaron Rodgers' completion percentage was higher than Tom Brady's. Aaron Rodgers' touchdown to interception was better than Tom Brady. Yet Aaron Rodgers woo, plunged head first over the cliff. Tom Brady is still ascending. I'm confused. You keep talking about Aaron Rodgers. He, he can't do it anymore. How about this? In the Mason crossbar game that you keep talking about, Skip Bayless, he was 355 yards and 34 points. In the Dad's Odell belt, boat trip, 362 and four touchdowns. And in the Dad's caught it game, he had three TDs, 316, and he ran out the clock. And the reason why y'all didn't get that catch is because of what happened in the Hail Mary game. 
You remember the Hail Mary game? Uh, not the Hail Mary. Yeah, the original Hail Mary. Drew Pearson pushed off. Somebody upstairs never forgot about that, and he was just waiting for the right time to pay you guys back. Now, that being said, Skip Bayless, and you keep saying Aaron Rodgers, in Aaron Rodgers' last seven losses, his last seven playoff losses, his defense averages giving up 34 points a game. In 41 career playoff games, Tom Brady's defense has given up 34 points twice. They gave up 41 in the Super Bowl, and if I'm not mistaken, they gave up 38 in the AFC Championship game against the Colts. Let that sink in for just a second, folks. In two games in 41, Tom Brady's defense has given up 34 points or more. In two, Aaron Rodgers has had that in the last seven playoff losses. What? Skip Bayless, and you talking about they're operating under the same apparatus. Aaron Rodgers has thrown one touchdown pass in his career to a receiver or a tight end that was selected in the first round. Let that sink in for just a second, people at home. And Skip Bayless telling you this man is washed up. Skip, now look. Do they have Aaron Rodgers? They wanted his attention. I believe they have his undivided attention by selecting him. But he knows he's not going anywhere. He's like, what y'all going to do? Cut me? I appreciate it. And I go right to the Bears and beat the brakes off y'all every single year if you force me to. I don't want to leave, but if you force me to, I will. Skip, he knows they can't do anything right now. He's there for it at the bare minimum. To, at the bare minimum, he's there two years probably three, but this notion that Aaron Rodgers has some died, somehow cliff died while Tom Brady is ascending in a paragraph. Skip, that's not true, and you know it. That's why Tom Brady dipped, because he's like, I ain't got no talent here. Let me go link up with Mike Evans. Let me go link up with Chris Godwin, Cameron Brake, O.J. Howard. No. If you the GOAT, you don't run. Skip Bayless told me GOATs don't run. See, that's the one thing I don't like about LeBron. He ran to Miami, linked up with D. Wade, who told, showed him how to win. Mm -hmm. Yo guy waited. And now look at it. Ran, he ran faster leaving New England to get to Tampa than he did at the Combine. Huh, Skip Bayless. And we know how God awful slow and how bad he looked running at the Combine. But boy, he did like a faux faux getting up out of New England to go to the warm weather in Tampa and get with those receivers. Stop it, Skip. You know better. You know I love how when you're losing a debate on Aaron Rodgers, you have to bring in other names. So this time you've reached for Tom Brady. Tom Brady is you seven years up. older than Aaron Rodgers. Seven years older. Like, Tom Brady did like not have Devontae Adams. Do, do you know who Devontae Adams is? You ever watch him? He is a yes. stud. He is a Pro Bowl receiver. And Aaron did have him last year. And Jimmy Graham's still pretty good, and he did have him last year. And Valdez Scantling, every time I look up, he's making a big catch. I know he wasn't a high pick, but he makes plays. He's a big, tall, strong uh -oh. receiver. And again, Tom Brady didn't have Devontae last year. And Aaron Rodgers hasn't had a coach trying to push him out the back door for the last four years, the way Belichick completely disrespected and mistreated Tom Brady over the last four years. He didn't have that. So now you're trying to compare Aaron's situation to Brady's. And yeah, Brady got no. pushed out the back door and finally said, okay, I'm going on 43 years of old, years of old age. So I'm I'm gonna go to I'm gonna take my talents to South, you know, to South to Tampa Bay. And I'm going to show you, Belichick, <laughs> I can get to a Super Bowl before you get to a Super Bowl. So this isn't about Tom Brady. It's about Aaron Rodgers. And it's about the two men who are over Aaron Rodgers right now. And they're saying he's in decline. Last year, his stat, each of the last three years, his stats have fallen. And he did have Devontae. Devontae is really but, good. But, and they're saying it, we're not good enough with Aaron Rodgers. Well, Skip, what about adding a running back? They got a running back in the second round, but what about saying that, you know what, because Aaron is not, maybe he's not the Aaron Rodgers of eight years ago. He's plenty good, but what if we take some of the pressure off like the Patriots did for Tom Brady in the last Super Bowl run? You remember that, Skip Bayless? 
Averaged 162 yards per game rushing. Sonny Michelle, Rex Burkhead, ran it down the char- ran it down the Chargers throat, ran it down the Chiefs throat, did the exact same thing to the Rams. What about that, Skip? See, all you want to do is just look at it. Oh, yeah, they're gonna show Aaron Rodgers who's boss. Skip, they did that last year. That this was a different, this is not the Ted Thompson. He basically said, I wouldn't hire the coach that I wanted. I don't care if you like it or not. And by the way, don't muck it up. Don't you be the problem. I believe he told Aaron that because why else would like, he gonna say, I called him and asked him, did you say that? Why would you call and ask him? You know he said it. Hell, he called you and told you that. They didn't run it by skill. Normally what they do is that they run certain things, especially when you're a quarterback of that ilk, they run offensive guys. They might not tell you about the defensive side of the football, but as far as a receiver, tight end, running back, they're going to tell you. Quarterback, yeah, they're going to tell you. But boy, but okay. Aaron Rodgers is just fine. His numbers were better than your guys last year. Last quick point. It was just two years ago that Tom Brady took the New England Patriots on another Super Bowl roll and won a yeah, sixth Super them. Bowl. And in so doing... He threw for 343 yards against the Chargers when you picked the Chargers to win at Foxborough. Then he went to my uh-huh. homeboy's stadium in Kansas City in the cold. Uh-huh. And in overtime, he converted three straight third and tens. Outrageously uh-huh. all-time goatish great. And then went and pulls yeah. off the fourth quarter game-winning drive against the Rams defense Wade Phillips had been his nemesis. I don't know how much greater oh. you can get than that. I'm sorry, that was just two seasons ago. Uh, oh, scored 13 points in the Super Bowl, and then he scores, and then his defense gives up 14 points. And then Tom Brady throws a pick six, can only get 13 in the first half. But he's on the ascent. He's climbing. What else? No mercy. Jerry Krause infamously broke up the Bulls following their 1998 championship by not bringing back Phil Jackson, which resulted in Michael Jordan retiring and ultimately ending Chicago's dynasty. And we may have just seen the end of the Patriots dynasty as Bill Belichick and Tom Brady parted ways this offseason after 20 years in New England. Uh, Shannon, since you are the relationship expert on our show, do you see any similarities with these breakups. <laughs> I do, but Skip, the dynasties really started in, in civilization. When you talk about history, you talk about the Roman Empire, you talk about the Tang Dynasty, the Joe Dynasties. And normally what happened with dynasties, Skip, they get overthrown. They go to war, they lose, and the, and the winning party, they take over the empire. They get overthrown. The dynasties are overthrown. But in sports dynasties, we're very seldom do we see someone overthrow them. What normally happens is ego and greed get involved, and then the dynasty starts to fall apart. I want credit. You're getting too much credit. I'm a big emphasis. Skip, like I said, and I said this the other day, I said this the other day, Skip. Jerry Krause is the ultimate shield because he shielded Jerry Reinsdorf from the criticism that he rightfully deserves, Skip. Jerry Reinsdorf, if he wanted to keep this team together, he could have kept it together, Skip. He didn't like the fact because Michael Jordan in his last two years started asking, I want my worth. I want 30 million one year. I want 33 the next. Well, Skip, if he keeps it together in 99, what's he going to have to pay Jordan? Scottie Pippen is up. Scottie Pippen's going to want somewhere between 12 and 15 million dollars. Dennis Rodman was up. He was making 9 million his last year. He's going to want to raise. And Jerry Reinsdorf didn't want to pay that. And But also, there was a lot of conflict. Jerry Reinsdorf didn't get the credit that he deserved. There have been very few times, Skip, when you look at it. I and mean, I look at, like, I don't know a whole lot of owners, an NFL owner, Skip. I played for two. I played for uh, Mr. Bowling and his family, who still owns the team, and I played for Art Modell. Now, Steve Bashotti was a minority owner. I've gotten to know him a little bit over the years by going back. But I know Mr. B. The other owner that I know fairly well from having conversation with is, is uh, Mr. Kraft. Now, Skip, I believe... Mr. Kraft would have kept this thing running. He'd have kept putting oil in the car. He's kept changing the child. He'd get his service every 3,000 miles like he's supposed to. He would have let this thing roll alone until the wheels fell off. But there was a dilemma going on that something skipped that he couldn't control. Now, he tried to control these egos as long as he could. He, he, he stomped one of them out in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, Skip, 2017, 2018. But this one he couldn't do anything with. And it finally got the best of him. 
And there are similarities because the egos in this was Coach Belichick and Tom Brady. Who deserves the lion's share of the credit? I drafted you. I put all this together. But Tom Brady said, but you ain't threw not one pass. You ain't make one audible, not one check. And Coach Belichick said, yeah, but I drafted you. All these pieces that surround you, I'm responsible for. Well, Michael Jordan, like with Jerry Krause, you ain't played no game with no fever. You ain't played no game with no migraine, hurt. Yeah, but I put it together. And so there are the similarities, Skip. But the one similarity is that Jerry Reinsdorf deserves a lot more blame for this falling apart than we've given him, Skip. And Mr. Kraft deserves none of the blame because he kept it together as long as he could. And then finally, when Tom's like, you know, I had enough. I, you want me back now, but I don't want to come back because you could have remedied this three years ago and you didn't. So, Skip, there are some similarities. And what mostly breaks up sports dynasty, Skip, is ego and credit. I need more, and my ego needs to be filled by saying it, that I need more. Okay. You make a lot of good points. I'm going to try to make mine because I think I have a pretty good feel for this. I was there okay. in Chicago for the last Bulls run, 1998. I was the columnist of the Tribune, so I got to see the last dance from the inside out. And right. I agree with your big picture premise here. The similarity is that, that in both cases, you have one man as a team builder who thinks that he's such a mastermind that, that he can rebuild or reload without the star player, the superstar goat player, right. and show the world yeah. that he can do it solo. So Jerry Krause believed with all his heart and soul he could start over without Phil Jackson and obviously then without Michael Jordan and show the world, watch this. I'll build another right. dynasty without Michael and without Phil. And obviously Bill right. Belichick as the team builder, who, who happens also to be the coach, he's saying, I right. can go solo here. I can rebuild my football team as the personnel director and then I'll coach what, what I gather and show you I can win a Super Bowl without Tom Brady. Well, Jerry Krause failed miserably in his pursuit <laughs> of another championship. And, and I believe Belichick also will fail miserably. So that's the similarity. Now to your bigger picture yes. point. From the start, Jerry Reinsdorf backed Jerry Krause, had his back on every issue completely empowered yep. Jerry Krause to run the Chicago yep. Bulls. Hands down, unchallenged, unquestioned. Jerry Krause, it's your yep. baby. If you want to do that or that, you do that or that, and I'm not going to say a word because I hired you to run that show. I, my hands are clean over here. I, I don't want any part of that. Don't blame me. Blame him. So you're right. And they were birds of a feather. I think they were kindred spirits, Krauss and Reinsdorf. They were both little men yep. who became big men. And they did like the limelight, and they did like credit to a fault. But neither one right. of them wanted any blame. But the point exactly. was, Jordan had to deal with that from the start. Krauss didn't even draft Jordan. Rod Thorne did. And then here comes Jerry a year or so right. later. Was it a year? Yeah, a year later. And... Late, so yep. he had to live with a guy who, who didn't draft him. And, and Michael lasted 13 years in Chicago before the dynasty was broken up. And it was broken up when he was 34. What happened in New England? The owner always had Brady's back, always supported Tom. Yep. In any conflict, uh -huh. Tom, Tom, yes, I'm with Tom. I choose Tom. And that's why right. Tom lasted 20 years in New England before it finally got to be too much for Tom. But even to the bitter end, according to the NFL Network report, remember, yeah. Kraft was still backing Brady. According to them, they were, a or yeah. at least Robert Kraft and his son, were holding out hope that all the way to that faithful Monday night meeting in free agency week, they were hoping that he'd say, okay, let's do it another year. And when he chose Tampa, right. according to the NFL Network, they were willing to match the two years and 50 million that Tampa guaranteed Brady, 25 and 25 a year. Right. 
So Correct. it looked like to the death, Robert Kraft is on Brady's side. Now, he propped up Belichick on, on any football matter. He just let anything slide. Yes. You know, to me, I'm going to say it one more right. time, Shannon. What happened in that Super Bowl loss to the Eagles? That's a fireable offense to me for a head coach. I, I still can't figure it out. Inexplicably, he benched Malcolm Butler for the whole game. The one player who had played the most snaps on his defense, his best DB, is benched while Nick Foles throws the all-time Super Bowl party on Belichick's defense to the tune of 41 points, and they win 41 to 33. I, it, it felt sabotage to me on Brady as he throws for a, a playoff record, 505, puts up 33, and loses. So to me, it was already looking like at that point, Belichick's going to do everything in his power to make it harder and harder on Tom Brady, but Kraft wouldn't intervene on that. He, he would back off on that. Right. But when push came to shove, Jimmy G or Tom, no, I'm sorry, Bill. No, nope, you're going to have to trade. I, I order you to trade Jimmy G. And he gave Jimmy G away to the 49ers for a mere second round pick, which I thought was a spite trade. So, so to me, yeah. the, the crux of the difference is Kraft supports the quarterback while Reinsdorf on the other side only supported the GM. Another difference, Skip, is that in Chicago, the GM hated the head coach. In New England, the GM loved the head coach because they're the same person. <laughs> so, that so he's like the GM yeah, got along true. great with the GM. The GM got along great with the head coach. And Skip, what happens is yeah. is that because Jerry Krause had won those championships, you know, Skip, how it goes when you win. The owner is willing to give the general manager a little more leeway, a little more leeway, a little more leeway, a little more leeway, until, yep. the, and, until at one point, the fact of the matter is that Jerry Reinsdorf would even consider trading Scottie Pippen. But Jerry Krause had convinced him, like, yeah, we, yep. if we can get some great value, we should. And Jerry Reinsdorf's like, okay, if you can right. get great value. Uh, and that's what happened with Coach Belichick, Skip. He had won so much. They had been so successful that even Coach Mr. Kraft entertained it. That's why he didn't have a problem. Think about all the guys. He traded Seymour. He traded Logan Mankins. Logan Mankins was all decade guard. He let Ty Law walk out the door, Willie McGinnis. He let a yeah. lot of guys go. And Mr. Kraft didn't blink an eye because he had been so successful, no. Skip. Who am, I to, who am I to argue with that? It wasn't until that way, like, whoa, wait a minute, Bill, you for real? Because I can assure you, Skip, when Coach Belichick went in Mr. Kraft's office and says, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bob, I want to trade Tom. Mr. Kraft probably looked at him, say, you know, probably, you know, slid back from his desk, looked at him like, Billy, you you serious? Uh, I can't allow you to do that. But Coach Belichick had been given so much power, Skip. It's like, why not? But this time, and I told you, Skip, when it happened, I said, Skip, Tom won this round. This this will go around with Mr. Kraft. I don't believe Mr. Kraft going to be in his corner. And he wasn't. It wasn't until Tom, like, Tom had had enough and says, I'm gone, is that finally Mr. Kraft says, okay, we'll match that. But it was too late. Tom had not made up his mind. He was done with Coach Belichick. I want nothing else to do with him. We'll make up somewhere down the line. But right now, too much damage has been done. Last thought. The only way Belichick got away with all those crazy trades was that Tom Brady overcame every one of them. He overshadowed it. Mm -hmm. He canceled them. He was the reason Belichick could be Belichick. And I still say he was 75% of the credit that he didn't get from Belichick to me. No mercy. The Cowboys VP of Player Personnel, Will McClay, told 105.3, the fan, quote, one of the first things Mike McCarthy said that made me jump up and down was players over scheme. This was clearly seen during the draft when the Cowboys selected receiver CeeDee Lamb at 17, despite not needing help at the position. So Shannon, how much did this change in philosophy have to do with the Cowboys' success during the draft? There is no change in philosophy. That's easy to say after the, after the fact. Skip, let's, let's say for the sake of argument, one of those top corners were there. Okuda, uh, Henderson, uh, Terrell, and CeeDee Lamb is there at 17. Which one they taking, Skip Bayless? 
It's easy to say after the fact. You know what? You do know, Skip, but you know, let me tell you what happened, Skip. This all goes back to what happened on draft day in 1998. The best player on the board was who, Skip Bayless? Randy Moss. Jerry Jones never forgot that. They didn't really need a receiver, but he was the best. And they say, nah, he got a couple of red flags. We ain't messing with it. And he punished them every time. And Jerry Jones bowed from that point on. That's also one of the reasons, Skip, that he disregards red flags now. It doesn't matter if the court player has a checkered pass. He's like, if the guy's talented, I'm not letting him go. I don't care. That's what this is about. This was not about no oh, oh, change in philosophy. Skip, as I mentioned on the other day, I said, if you look at Mike McCarthy when he had his greatest success, what did he have? Jordy Nelson, Greg Jennings, James Jones, and Jermichael Finley. That's when he had his greatest success. Three wides and a tight end and a running back. Now, all of a sudden, oh, it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy, really? Stop this notion. That's just, he was the best available player. All they did was take the best available player at the time. But it would have been interesting had Chase Young or Jeff Okuda or Henderson been sitting there. Do they take C.D. Lamb? Hell no. You know it. I know it. They just want to, oh, we, what, what we do not, Mike McCarthy is a philosophy type of guy. Man, y'all need to stop this. I see through that bull job y'all do it. Okay. I'll give you this. If Okuda had fallen to 17, I think they would have taken Okuda because that's an obvious need <laughs> with Byron Jones having gone to the Dolphins. But remember, they had C.D. Lamb, as I kept telling you, I said he's the best receiver in the draft. On their board, they had him at six. I'm going to guess they had Okuda at three or four, so I'm going to guess they would have taken him but only Okuda, not any of the other names that you threw out there. CeeDee Lamb Can fell jump. from 6 to 17. Yeah, well, I mean, he's two on the board, so, right? Maybe, I don't know where they had him. I'm, I'm going to guess two. Yeah, they oh, probably you take Chase But you say talent. I'll give you that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, but I'm, I'm just saying they, they had CD all the way up at six. So, quick point of order on what you said about Randy Moss. I just said in the previous topic, I was in Chicago as the columnist of the Tribune in 98. I wrote a column before the draft saying, if the Bears pass Randy Moss, they will forever regret it. And they took Cade McNown, and I immediately wrote the next day after the draft, they will forever regret that, and they did. Everybody had big red <laughs> flags on Randy, and then Dave Wanstead, then he, the former Cowboy coach, Jimmy's defensive coordinator, was the head coach then of the Bears, and he pulled me aside after the draft and said, Randy Moss skipped the meeting they had set up for him in Chicago. He didn't even come downstairs from his hotel room to meet us in the lobby. He disappeared, and they said, we couldn't take him because that's the reddest flag of all. So I got that. Right. CD had no red flags that I'm aware of. I don't know a red flag. He seems like a great kid and a leader of the football team. So anyway, the point is, back to this strategy change, alleged. For once, Shannon, I I'm going to do something I've never done on Undisputed. I got to defend Jason Garrett because this is coming across between the lines as Will McClay taking a shot at Jason and his staff, saying that I jumped right. up and down when Mike McCarthy told me, oh, we want player over scheme. We'll take talent over somebody who will fit. And he made the point, we were 10 years with Jason Garrett and his staff, and we had to learn their likes and their dislikes. So occasionally, I guess he's suggesting we took a player that the coaches liked over a player that we as personnel people favored. Well, time out. Do you realize, Shannon, that over the last 10 years, the Dallas Cowboys have had the second most Pro Bowl players in the NFL to Kansas City? The second most. And time out. Going into last season, <laughs> by everybody's assessment, Everybody thought the Dallas Cowboys were the most talented team in pro football. Pro football focus thought Dallas had the most loaded overall roster going into last season, which is why I said yes. I'm picking them to win the NFC. 
Okay, so help me right. out, Will McClay. And I love what Will McClay has done, but how on earth did you manage to assemble all that talent when you were hamstrung by Jason Garrett and the, the assistant coaches? Baloney. No. I mean, I, I look down the list. You're, you're just, you're, you're spilling with pro bowlers. I, I'm looking at Ty Smith and Zach Martin and, and Travis Frederick, who just retired, obviously, and Zeke and Sean Lee and Demarcus Lawrence and Amari Cooper that they traded their first for is obviously a pro bowler. And then Leighton right. Vander Esch has made it and Jalen Smith has made it. And I can just go on and on. They've even had a punter and a long snapper make the Pro Bowl in the last decade. I don't know what's not to like about the draft. And he, they always say that Jerry has final say. So let's give Jerry the credit. He said, boom, boom, boom. He's pulled the right trigger every time. He's made the right choice on the fly way more often than not. And the only swing right. and miss that's glaring at the moment was last year, a year ago. They didn't have a first because they gave it for Amari. Okay, I'm good with that. Right. I didn't love Amari on the road you last year, that. but I, I sure loved him in those, those six or seven games that he came the, the year before down the stretch. Right. And yet mm -hmm. they took Tristan Hill out of Central Florida with their second-round pick last year, and I was told Rod Marinelli, now the ex-defensive coordinator, fell in love with him, even though I read and read and read before the draft, he'd been in the coach's doghouse the whole year and been out of the starting lineup, and he was written off as difficult to coach. But Marinelli loved him for his scheme. He liked smaller defensive tackles with a little more slither to them, you know, a little more penetration to them. And I, I don't know what happened to Tristan Hill last year, but he just couldn't play. And I'm pretty sure he's still on the roster, but Shannon, I think he's on the way out. So is between the lines, <laughs> is, is McClay trying to tell us that if not for Marinelli pushing for him, I would have taken somebody else? Because remember, there are a bunch of safeties sitting right there. Taylor Rapp and Juan Thornhill, right. they can play. Right. We saw yeah. Rams, Chiefs, yes. until Thornhill got hurt. They yep. can play. And they're sitting hurt. right there, and they took yep. Tristan Hill. Mm -hmm. And he was a bust. I'm pretty yep. sure he's over yep. and out. Okay, is that what he's talking <laughs> about? But, but don't tell me it's a philosophical change. You, you, you just about led the whole league in Pro Bowl players over the last decade. That'll work. So in other words, Gil, what he's trying to say, we got a team full of guys that didn't even fit our philosophy. We just took it because they were good. So they don't really fit what we want to do. I guess so. We just took Ty Smith and Zach Martin, who are two all-decade offensive linemen. We ain't even really like them. But, you know, just because they, no, they, they don't like fit off a lot. Man, stop. Zeke? Skip, I, I give I Skip, don't you know. remember, uh, I was watching this story. Skip, I was watching the other day. They was talking about, uh, Tony Dungeon was talking about how he wanted Warren Sapp because he felt Warren Sapp was perfect. Now, we saw Warren Slap, Sapp slide in the draft, but he said he's perfect. This guy's Joe Green. We're going to play a 43 He'll be the under tackle, get up the field, wreak havoc. And Warren Sapp, yeah. slide, slide, slide. Come to Minnesota, they don't select him. He wanted Derrick Brooks. They don't. And come to find out, the next year, he's in Tampa coaching the guy that he wanted in Minnesota. Uh -huh. Skip, when the guy is that immensely talented, you take him. You don't pay Well, you know, kind of Warren Sapp, you know. Derrick Brooks, he's a little smallish. Huh? Really? to say the same thing about Ray. Ray too small. He only like six foot tall, like 225. Yeah. So, yeah, yep. no, okay. Skip, when, when guys are that okay. talented, you don't pass that up. They make it seem like they, they took... Nope. Skip, because here's the thing. If they don't take C.D. Lamb at 17 and take somebody else, everybody's going to crush him and say, you reach because the guy fell in your lap and you bypassed him. So it was almost like they had to take him. Okay. So let's not blame Jason Garrett for this. I'm glad he's yes. gone. Yes. He actually should get credit for what he left in the cupboard because yes. it's loaded. Yes. Very, very. No mercy. So Carson Wentz has already had an up and down start to his career dealing with multiple injuries, which we know. And now Eagles beat reporter Tim McManus is saying that Philly's pick of Jalen Hurts in the second round will only bring more turbulence to Wentz after he signed a $128 million extension. So Shannon, how much will Hurts' presence hurt Wentz? 
Well, quarterbacks are territorial, Skip. It's always been that way. It's always, it's always been that way, and it always will be, Skip. There was friction between Joe Montana and Steve Young. I remember when the Broncos selected Tommy Maddox after, we Skip, we had just lost the AFC Championship game by three points to Buffalo. And the Broncos select Tommy Maddox with the first round. I, I, know what, I know what that did. And you look at it. What you think Eli Manning thought, Skip, when he took Daniel Jones last year? We heard Ben Rothenberg when they took Mason Rudolph. I ain't getting ready. That let, let the coaches get it. So you bring, you create, sometimes, Skip, you create a monster that you didn't even have to. You created Frankenstein when you should have been making a nice, a nice cocktail. And you created a monster that didn't even need to be. This is the way Carson Wentz needs to approach it, Skip. If I'm healthy, there's no way Jason Hurt, Jalen Hurt, excuse me, Jason, Jalen Hurts can beat me out for this job. And that's the way he has to approach it. Now, Skip, they might give him some packages where it kind of like what they did with uh, uh, Lamar Jackson when Joe Flacco was there. But for me, you created something, Skip. He's in the first year, he's 27. He's in the first year of a $120 million deal, $63 plus million dollars fully guaranteed. And you bring in Jalen Hurts, you talk about we develop quarterbacks. No, you don't. You develop quarterback. You'll develop a quarterback. Skip, what we do? We'll develop a quarterback, Skip, if we need one. Are you saying you need a quarterback? Because all I know is this. You, you, you do this. I can assure you, I don't care. He's looking like, man, they took a quarterback after they gave me all this. Maybe they're not as, as sure about me, as sure in me as they say they are. And I need to just make sure I'm on my best behavior. I'm going to make sure I'm healthy. I'm going to make sure I play my best, and then I'll let the chips fall where they may. That's all he can do, Skip. Nothing else. Everything else is out of his control. They've already turned the card in. Jalen Hurst has already put the hat on, got the T-shirt. He's a Philadelphia Eagle. So there's nothing else Carson Wentz can do now but go out and play well and keep Jalen Hurts on the bench as long as he can. So... I hear you, and I'm going to take it a step farther. And obviously, I'm a big Jalen Hurts fan. You knew that going into the draft. I've never been the biggest Carson right. Wentz fan, though I thought he played pretty to very well through stretches last year, and I was impressed. But the more I think about this, the worse it feels to me for Carson Wentz. Mm -hmm. Remember, he had to overcome that ghost of Nick Foles but at least Nick Foles was gone starting last year. At least he was in Jacksonville, right. so he was no longer looking over Carson's shoulder as they went into last season. But he had to overcome the cloud hanging over his head of that phillyvoice.com story. Remember, last, you know, this mm -hmm. is two off-seasons ago. They wrote a piece yeah. that the headline was, uh, Sources Inside the Eagles, uh, paint Carson Wentz as selfish, uncompromising, and playing favorites. And it, it came off after you read the piece as if, dare I say, he was carcinogenic in the locker room, like he, he was a really a bad <laughs> force in the locker room. And trust me on this, Jalen Hurts is the flip side of that. Jalen Hurts is a quiet force in the weight room and in the locker room and in the huddle. Players will gravitate to Jalen Hurts. He's a powerful leader with a strong football backbone and, and a big, strong, good heart that everybody around him loves and sort of feeds off. So he, he won't make waves. He, he won't make public waves. He won't make it hard. He won't apply pressure externally on Carson, but internally, I think you'll start to feel a shift in that team toward Jalen, especially if he gets his opportunities and cashes them in. Again, I don't consider Jalen a gadget guy, and I'm not sure how he's going to respond in little short bursts of plays here and there and here and there. Right. But if Carson, and I'm knocking on wood for Carson because I don't even like to bring this up on live TV. But if Carson does get hurt, and he's had his share of injuries, maybe more than his share, and Jalen gets a shot, I think Jalen will cash in on his shot. And that will make it really difficult on Carson, even though they will say when he's healthy, he gets his job back. That city turns quickly on quarterbacks. You know it, and I know it. I think that team could turn yeah. quickly toward Jalen against Carson. 
because Jalen's just that kind of a lightning rod leader. So, again, Jalen's not in Jacksonville. He's now on the sideline in Philadelphia. So there's a direct threat right. and a credible threat. And remember, even though Carson played all 16 last year, God bless you, man. And they, they were pretty good. They went nine and seven. They were good enough to edge my Cowboys by one game. He was okay. Pro Football Focus ranked him the 16th best quarterback. But then he gets to his playoff game. It's his first playoff start, Shannon. And what happens? Shortly in, he gets concussed and he's out. He completed one ball for four yards. And that's his extent of his playoff career. He's completed one pass for four yards. So I think... Howie Roseman and Peterson sat back and said, my God, we, we really like this kid, Jalen Hurts. Let's, let's take a flyer on, in the second round because we may need him if Carson continues to be injury prone. And they might even be thinking they may need him if Carson teeters and starts to struggle. So I, it, it, well, it, get- the handwriting is on the locker room wall. It's scribbled all over the locker room wall that you are in some trouble, Carson Wentz. Well, Skip, what happened was is that anytime you give up what they gave up to get Carson Wentz, he automatically comes in, and he came in wanting respect that he didn't earn. And so he carried himself in such a way that turned off a lot of people. I don't care how you come in, but, bro, you hadn't done what you did over there? It's fine. But I need to see some of that right here. And he hadn't shown that. And he was wanting, he was carrying himself like he, like, whoa, bro, bro, slow down. You're not the MVP of the league. You're not the Super Bowl champ. The other guy won the Super Bowl, and you carrying yourself in such a way that I'm sure it rubs some of the people the wrong way. But I think now, Skip, this is a wake-up call for him. He knows he's going to have to stay healthy and play well in order to keep that job. Definitely a wake-up call. No mercy. When the story emerged that Tom Brady accidentally entered the wrong house while attempting to visit offensive coordinator Byron Leftwich, many called for a potential rules violation since offseason programming had not started and players and coaches were not allowed to meet. However, the NFL investigated and found no rules violations. So, Shannon, should Brady have been given a pass for this? Hell no. Nah. In phase one of the offseason, it says players cannot participate in club supervised workout, practices, meetings, film study, or playbook study with any coach, either in person or virtually. So in other words, what he did, Jenny, he smoked the weed, but he didn't inhale. I guess because he didn't make eye contact with Byron Leftwich, or he didn't see him. Well, maybe he was working for Grubhub and just dropped him some, you know, some food off. Maybe he Uber eats now. Skip Bayless, you know they're wrong for this, but guess what? Next year, they're going to put in place. Now you can't even go by the coach's house. You can't drop anything off. This is going to be the Brady rule. They should have fined his butt, and they should have fined uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because this was wrong, and you know it. I don't know it. Shannon Sharp, you, you grew up with goats. The goat is, is <laughs> in a new pasture. you got to let the goat roam. you got to let no. him graze occasionally, even in the barnyard. you got to let him graze. And in this no. case, it was no harm, no foul. He dropped by his coordinator's house to pick up his new playbook. That is no big not deal. not to do that. Let it go. You're Give not him a to pass. Do that. The NFL... Well, again, it's is that like a, a, a horrible violation? No, he's just Whoa. stopping by to get Hold a playbook. Skip. He's a, a new buccaneer. Speed, speed, skip. Speeding is not armed robbery, but is it a violation? Absolutely. Okay. And I so do know a thing about ghosts. Now, and we had. A, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well, you, you're, now you're saying Tom Brady broke a law of the land speeding. He did not speed. <laughs> and again, he was not yes, smoking marijuana. It's not like I did not <laughs> inhale. I'm sorry. He was yes, picking up yep. a playbook. And, and you with your Brady hate are trying to, to vilify him for this. Yeah, I tell you what, a new ghost, when we put him in the pasture, we had an electric fence. It didn't take them long to realize they weren't supposed to touch that fence because that electric, that electric current went through them and they backed up. <laughs> Fine. Brady always gets you guys going before we end the show. That's it for Undisputed. We'll be back tomorrow, same time. The herd is up after us. Have a good day, guys. <laughs>